I want to just remind all of you guys, we'll just show two headlines tonight, one at a time. Guys, the first headline that goes up is this. This is extremely important news uh, that is breaking uh, just yesterday. Uh, this should not surprise you, but I appreciate this article because now we can talk about some things that previously I've alluded to you guys before. There's things that I want to talk to you about, but I can't do it just yet. Well, this is one of those things. And this is the Chinese connection between what's going on in Israel right now today. Iran, China, Russia, they're the ones responsible for the catastrophic cyber attack that hit Israel that disabled Israeli's ability to defend its borders. Israel's borders all around the nation are the most high-tech border systems in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been there and about uh, 20 yards on each side of the border wall and border fence is highly electronic uh, uh, dirt, terrain, sand. Uh, it's not only um, optically viewed, but it, it is also viewed with AI device, meaning if the computer sees something move, uh, there's a quick, almost instantaneous translation uh, to command uh, about what's going on at any given location throughout the nation of Israel. That's how a little country the size of New Jersey stays alive in a really enough na neighborhood in which it lives. And uh, on top of that, uh, the drone uh, protection of Israel's borders is legendary. All of that failed. It all failed and nobody knew. No alarms went off. Everything that was to notify didn't notify and so that's why you were sleeping or that's why you were celebrating the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and that's how you put your kids to bed uh, and they get taken right from their bedrooms and you also are either killed or you are a survivor. Um, you, you, you look and you say, how could this happen? Where, where was Israel's defense? Uh, it was completely overwhelmed by Chinese and Iranian and Russian technologies that got together to attack Israel. That's a serious issue. And now, as of yesterday, China declares America the villain in Hamas brutality against Israel. This should not surprise you. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, right now, the United States um, is probably falling for the trick. Here's the trick to lure the United States into a Middle East war. That's currently what is believed by many, but apparently not by this current administration. We do not have the capabilities to wage a war in the Middle East at this time. It's a tragic statement to make, but those of you who have family and are friends in the U.S. military, you know exactly what's going on regarding the supply capabilities of our equipment, and our munitions. We are out. We ship them to Ukraine, and that's not a joke. We have turned around and sent billions of dollars from Barack Obama to Joe Biden, billions of dollars. In fact, still to this day, Barack Obama, without congressional knowledge, flew C-17 transport aircraft with pallets of cash to the Iranian regime and has never been held account to that act of treason. Very terrible. We have armed Iran, we have equipped Iran, and now we are gonna receive the wrath of Iran unless God intervenes. But Russia and this access of evil with China and Iran have set their sights on the United States. And tragically, the USS Gerald R. Ford, the most powerful, piece of real estate on the face of the earth with its strike group is now parked off the coast of Tel Aviv, off of Haifa, I should say. And we are now seeing the relocation of U.S. Marines being deployed onto the uh, Gerald R. Ford and or brought up in through the south. And you're going to hear a lot about Marine uh, movement, if you haven't already. Look, I'm not going to make a political statement. Figure it out yourself. Under the Bushes, we've had, we had nothing but war. 
George Jr. and George Sr., nothing but war. Under Barack Obama, we had nothing but war and terrorism. And then for four years, you didn't hear the, the acronym ISIS. You didn't hear the word Taliban. You didn't hear any of that for four years. And terrorism around the world came almost to a stop because the world trembled. The terrorist world trembled for fear. And shortly after President Trump was sworn into office, if you remember, I was actually on the ground in uh, northern Galilee. After that, no more ISIS. You didn't hear about that. But now we're back at it, and we've had nothing but war from Afghanistan to what's coming now. We're making a huge blunder. Not only does the United States not have the military might to pull this off, we don't have the military will to pull it off, and we certainly don't have the protection of Almighty God to pull it off. We have offended the God of heaven, and he's no longer, like he said to Israel, I will not go to battle with you anymore. And we're on our own on this one. That's a tragic thing for me to say. As somebody who is a supporter of our combat and of our nation's strengths, you cannot treat the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the way that we've treated him as a country. Now look, you're a Christian tonight, and if you're not a Christian, good luck. But if you're a Christian tonight, your sins have been forgiven you, and your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? As a nation, as a nation, read your Bible carefully. Good men and women went into captivity, such as Daniel, such as Ezekiel, such as Jeremiah. You ever think about that for a moment? How did good, good, godly people who even authored books in the Bible wound up going into prison? You got to remember, Daniel went to prison as a teenager in Babylon. He was taken captive. He was kidnapped, so to speak. He was the booty. Him and the, the others were the, the, the loot, the reward of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion, third and final invasion, taken captive as a teenager to Babylon, and he never saw home again. He was never allowed to return. He died in exile. Daniel is one of the greatest personalities of Scripture. How is it that this happened? Didn't God love Daniel? Yes, he did. But there's a difference between the fact that our sins have been forgiven on Christ at the cross. He took the penalty for us. But it's a whole different story when, it got, when it's regarding national sins. God will lead a nation or allow a nation to be taken into captivity when that nation offends him. And that even includes good people going into captivity. We'll see what that means, but may God have mercy on America. Uh, as Christians, we need to repent and seek God's face. And maybe, maybe the Lord might defend. But this is a very volatile moment. It's not going to go away. People are asking, and we'll address it on Sunday, what makes this latest volley of attacks different than any other time? Everything. This is different. Largest bloodshed of Jews since Adolf Hitler happened just the other day. This is different. And just today, the lieutenant commander of Hamas announced that on Friday the 13th, that he's calling upon, now watch this, the news is changing constantly right now on this one. It went out, and then they took it back, and then it went out, and then it's, and it's funny because the media tried to dampen the challenge because the lieutenant commander said, I want all uh, of Islam to rise up on Friday the 13th around the world and take out women and children. <laughs> Can you imagine? Go out there and bid up on women and kids. And... Um, and then they said, oh, wait, wait, no, we just meant Israel. And then the lieutenant commander said, wait a minute, that's not what I said. I said the whole world. So Friday the 13th is coming up. Friday the 13th, I got to be really quick on this. You have to come back on Sunday. Friday the 13th. Do you know why Friday the 13th is a bad day? Dr. Jeff Barkey, you should know this one. Friday the 13th is a bad day in the world. It's not a bad day if you're a Jew. Anybody know what day it was when the death angel passed through Egypt and slew? It was Friday the 13th. 
Saturday the 14th was the great day of deliverance. The Sabbath. Amazing, huh? So obviously, church, be careful where you're at on Friday the 13th. Um, yeah, church should be fine. We should probably hold a Friday the 13th church service. That's a great idea. Now, wait. Wait, I have to check with the staff first. I'm not saying we're doing it. We've got to pay overtime for that. But that's a really great idea. Um, we'll see how that goes. If, if, if something goes kooky, definitely show up at church no matter what. If things go crazy, I'll meet you here. Um, and then another slide real quick. Uh, marine, okay, yeah, marine uh, units leave Kuwait exercise early because of emerging events. Um, again, not a, not a good idea. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, I grew up uh, in the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, my utmost respect, uh, best, the best. Here's the problem. Again, I uh, wouldn't go anywhere without God. And um, my heart breaks for those of our young people who are in the military at this time under such a horrific uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff Pentagon leadership is so radically, so dramatically compromised. It's terrible. I was going to give you a string of verses tonight. We don't have the time for this. I'm going to ask you to just do a search on your own regarding the name Gaza. You should search it in your Bible app. Gaza. Gaza is where Samson had his eyes cut out and was killed. Gaza. Gaza has been for millennia a geographical location of Israel's enemies. Gaza. You know who used to hang out in Gaza also? A guy who was born in Gath. He had four brothers. Their names are in the Bible. His name is Goliath. Whatever goes on in Gaza is a weird thing for thousands of years. Isn't that strange? <laughs> Gaza, Eshkelon, very strange. It's a tragic event because, friends, listen, Hamas is a terrorist organization, as you well know, but it's a legitimate government now. Do you all know that? You need to know that. A lot of people are, 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 are tragically forgetting this. Do you know Israel has not had a footprint in Gaza since 2006? Anybody know that? Are you hearing, uh, 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 what's her name? Omar, uh, I always get it. I, I always get her name. All the whole, AOC, all those, whatever. They get, they're, they're just screaming and yelling about all this stuff that's going on there. Listen, Israel's been gone since 2006. They have their own legitimate nation. They're their own legitimate government. Here's the tragic thing about the poor people who are born in Gaza is that Hamas controls the people. It's Nazism on steroids. It's true abuse. And so the kids from the youngest of ages are, are raised up to grow up someday to hopefully kill a Jew. Taught it in school. At the demand of Hamas. So normally Hamas and Hezbollah in the north would kill each other, but they'll unite for one thing. Uh, two things. They'll unite to kill the Jew, and then they'll unite to kill the Christian. But they hate each other. But they're uniting to come against Israel. Um, you need to know your Old Testament. You need to know your Bible. So that you can answer your friends and family. Because there's, in my opinion, there's a demonic influence that's going on where people like and that led to the division of families and kid, grandkids not seeing grandparents anymore. Homes breaking up, marriages splitting up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the next wave of test for churches, for faith, and for nations. What will a nation decide to do with Israel and what will its population do regarding Israel? God says, you want to be blessed? You bless my people. You say, wait a minute, Jack, they don't do everything right. Of course they don't. Neither do you and I. But God says, they're my people. You say, if they're his people, well, why is it so horrible for them all the time? Deuteronomy said so. Moses said so. 
You follow God, you'll be, this is all the blessings that will come to you if you follow God. If you don't follow him, these are all the curses that will fall upon you. If you want to know what's going on, read Deuteronomy 28. But this is different this time, and you're going to need to come back on Sunday to find out why. (laughs) You guys, we have a very special time tonight together. This has been planned for a good while. We have not only uh, an amazing young man that's with us, he's been here before. Uh, He started out uh, just as your run-of-the-mill atheist liberal kid byproduct of the public school system who started to learn and listen and watch and see the results of the logic and path and pattern of what was being said. And he started thinking. And lo and behold, he wound up uh, eventually uh, getting hired by Prager University Uh, PragerU, where he popularized many of the -the on-the-street interviews with people on university campuses and the like. Um, And he's just continued. God has blessed him. And and a couple of guys from PragerU brought their friend with them. And I wound up meeting up with him right behind that screen. And we talked for a little while. And he prayed to accept the Lord on New Year's Eve. And I'm talking about Will Witt. Yep. In fact, I want to show you some pictures. That was on New Year's Eve, and this was a couple of uh, months after that. Uh, Listen, that's a winter day, ice cold, in Redondo Beach on a Saturday morning, and um, it was great. Much of PragerU came out there. Dr. Barkey, you were there that day, I remember. And um, it was just a very, very sweet day. I love this guy. Um, I'm old enough to be his dad, so it's okay for me to say this, is... um, I just consider him a son, and uh, I'm rich, and I'm blessed, and I'm wealthy in the spirit uh, regarding uh, his life and what God is doing. So church family, he's got a brand new book titled, Do Not Comply by Will Witt. This is an awesome read, subtitled, um, the subtitle is Taking Power Back from America's Corporate Elite. This is a powerful, awesome, excellent uh, book on exposing uh, What's going wrong with our nation? Bottom line, greed. There's a way to handle wealth and there's a way not to handle wealth. And Will has written a fantastic book. So please take advantage of that QR code. We've got 500 copies that are here tonight for you to get. But without further ado, give a warm welcome to our special guest tonight, Will Witt. Look at that guy. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so this is great. First of all... um, I look so much better in those pictures than I do look now. Well, you know what? That was not too long ago, but I know that I was was like 10 pounds lighter back then. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, But listen, your journey has been rapid. I mean, if I remember right, um, we're talking about a career that was only launched maybe, what, five or six years ago? Is that safe to say? Yes. Can you kind of walk ago. us through your background and how, how you've been placed in these strategic positions? Yeah. I mean, I grew up a liberal atheist my entire life, as, as Jack said, and we can get more into my faith journey and things in a, a little while. But I was never a conservative person or believed in conservative politics. For the most part, I thought politics was pretty dumb, but I thought that Obama was really cool and you know he was going to save the world and the, the world was burning because of climate change. These are the things that most young people think you know, nowadays. And so it wasn't until I went to college and I was an English major, which was a useless degree, and I was in a sociology class, which was a useless class, and there's a black girl sitting next to me, and my teacher in the class points at me and says, you are oppressing this girl next to you because of the color of your skin. Yeah, people, I mean, what are you supposed to do? And me and this girl looking at each other like, this is really awkward for both of us. Uh, She didn't think I was being, uh, I was offending her, or she didn't think that I was oppressing her, and I didn't think the same way. But this TA at a $50,000 a year university gets to come and tell me that I'm oppressing someone. Wow. This is how you create the victim culture in America. And so after this, I started getting really involved with conservative politics. I have plenty of other stories on, on people in my life mentoring me with, through this. But long story short, I got involved, found out about PragerU, and I went on my campus when I asked women what they thought about the wage gap on video. 
I taught myself how to shoot the video, edit the video. I sent it to PragerU because I love their videos, and they ended up offering me a job because they love the video. And so after two years of college, I dropped out, moved to Los Angeles from Colorado, and best decision saved, of my life. You got saved, brother. You got <laughs> saved. <laughs> exactly. Different kind of saved, but, <laughs> yeah. but good. Yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah. probably saved you, actually. I mean, I'm, uh, that rescued you from hitting down a path. Who knows what would have happened if you stayed in for an additional two years? Yeah, I mean... One of the stories that I really like to tell when I was in college is that this was that, that story happened that I just told. That happened, but I still wasn't super political or anything. I didn't really know much and was kind of just questioning racism at that time, I suppose. And so it wasn't until I was in a political science class my sophomore year, there was a girl who had a Trump pin on her backpack. And I was not political at all. This was in late or early 2016, right? And she comes up to me. I'd never met this girl. And I say, well, this is much different than I've heard from classmates and family and people around. Maybe I should look into this and see what it's all about. And because of one girl coming up and talking to me, a girl who I had never even met before, I'm now in the position that I am because she's the one who actually got me hooked up with Leadership Institute and Turning Point USA to start the chapter at my school to do this. And it's like everyone always talks about, you know, I'm just one person. What am I supposed to do against the, the, the corrupt elites in this country and all the people out there? But you have no idea the power that you have when you're just going and talking to people and the grassroots and the amazing conversations that you have. You have no idea the person who you might talk to at, at In-N-Out or at your school or even here at church who might be the next person to go and change the world. You have no idea. You know, it's so. amazing about what you're saying. That's exactly true about the gospel as well. We think that everybody's heard the gospel or what, you know, I'm sure they know. We make that assumption, but little do we know that we should, we should engage people anyway, no matter what. And that's how the gospel spreads. That's how relationships are established. And in this particular case, this is how a man's life is put on the course that God ultimately had for him anyway. While you were speaking, I, I thought immediately of this verse in, sec, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Listen to this. Old King James uh, Bible, by the way, has the word very, very powerfully. Paul says to Timothy in his closing remarks, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called science. And you did a documentary that we showed here, and if I remember right, uh, Michael... Schellenbacher was here yep. as well that uh -huh. night. Yeah. You guys, if you have not seen The Religion of Green, where can they get it? PragerU.com. Religion of Green, you can find it on there. It's about a 20-minute short film that we made a couple oh. of years ago. That was, that was a lot of fun. It was a second documentary. Please see that. The Religion of Green. I'm not kidding. Your junior hires and high schoolers must see this. Homeschoolers, public school teachers that are bold and courageous, show it to your class. The Religion of Green. The truth about... The Green Movement, I was, I was completely shocked mm -hmm. with the details of that. Um, I've never looked at, frankly, I've never looked at recycling the same. Yeah, yeah. I had they no send idea. All the, they send all the plastic bottles. You think you're throwing it in the recycling bin and they're recycling it. They're not recycling it. They're sending it to China or throwing it in the ocean for it to be burned. I mean, it, 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 you're not recycling. Some of the things like some of the aluminum and paper and things, some of these are actually recycled here in America. The but plastic, the plastic... Huh? Oh, no, they don't recycle the plastic. Don't, I just throw that in the trash. It's better to put it in the landfill than to put it in the recycling most of the time. So in his documentary, this is not what we're talking about tonight, but in his documentary, you guys need to see this because you see, you see kids in some, I don't know if it's Thailand or Calcutta or wherever they are in the world, you see kids that are burning uh, plastic and they're cooking their fish over the plastic and it's pure. I mean, it's a direct infusion of cancer. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Religion of green, get it and you'll be blown away. Um, so, you, God called you out and beyond, Prager you. Mm -hmm. Let's pick it up from there before we dive into the contents of the book. Yeah, so I now live in Florida. I, I lived out here in California for the last six years. I loved California, but I just felt like I had to go. I, I, I didn't really see myself staying at Prager you forever. God bless them. I love PragerU. Yeah. They're doing amazing work, but I just felt like I needed to get on my, out on my own. So I actually started a newspaper in Florida. I'm the editor-in-chief of a newspaper called the Florida Standard. Um, if it makes you guys happier, we are now banned on Instagram. That uh, means it's a great paper. Yes, yes. Well, we, we talked about the... We did a report on, first of all, that there are groups within the United Nations who are working with the government to fund this illegal alien, these illegal aliens who are coming yes. into our country. Evil, nonsensical stuff. And so that was our first strike. And then we talked about the Pfizer study 
uh, from their own documents that showed that 44% of the pregnant women in their studies actually had miscarriages. 44%. You're not seeing that reported anywhere else. And so then we report on it, and then we get banned for false information, even though it's Pfizer's own studies, and we're just relaying it to people. Yeah. So, so we're, you can say that's successful in a way. You know, <laughs> it's hard to really, really say, but, no, but we're doing as much what? as we can. It's amazing, though, that, that when you do something that does not go with the cultural or pre-planned norm, um, they're going to label you that quickly. And... Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a badge of honor. But, again, the Florida Standard? Uh-huh, the Florida Standard, the FLStandard.com. Anyone can find it on their social media as well. Say it again slowly. The FL Standard. FL Standard. Yeah. Uh, is it digital? Yeah, it's all digital. It's just too expensive to print. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. so make sure you get that, everybody. Um, okay, let's talk about the book. Um, why, why write it? What caused you to write this book? Well, when you see the words do not comply <laughs> on here... It's pretty simple to understand why, especially if you lived here in California. Pablo Picasso is someone that actually connects to this last chapter we we're talking about, transhuman. I do not like Pablo Picasso because what Picasso did is take humans yeah. and distort them. Instead of romantic, neoclassical, mm -hmm. these types of artists that said, I am going to elevate humans, elevate landscapes, elevate the earth, and make them look beautiful and heroic and fierce and, and magnificent... It is, let's, make, let's see how ugly we can make humans and items and objects and the world around us. And so now you look at postmodern art and, and other modern types of art in this country, and there's nothing beautiful about it. You look at the architecture that we have surrounding us, there's nothing beautiful about the buildings that we see, and they, they tear down the forests and put up factories. I mean... You know, I mean, this is why I say conservatives are the real environmentalists. We are the ones who should be looking at the world around us and saying, how can we preserve beauty? There's a reason why they want to make everything distorted and ugly and horrific and scary and all these scary movies and demonic things and all of this. It demoralizes you. It demoralizes you. Instead of having something beautiful that inspires you and brings you closer to God, it is something ugly that makes you feel evil and weak and sad. So in that chapter, I talk about the breakdown and how we can bring back beauty into our lives and, and really elevate that to the highest. That's a great point. Um, for everyone who has grandkids or kids in your life, um, you know, you ought to groom them in the right direction. The Bible says, raise up, train up a child in the way that they should go. What does that mean? It's quite simple. Uh, the Hebrew scriptures teach that your child, you're to know them. Okay, that implies you know them. And then you point them in the direction that they should go. Secondly, also, you, act, you enhance that direction based on their, their um, desires, their loves, their passions. They like architecture or they, do they like bugs? Is it animals? Ma do they love math? Some kids actually are born loving math. It's strange. Not me, no. But here's the thing is, you, you train up a child in a way that they should go. You know, we have the class system in America where this is the class. That's where that word comes from. You will learn, all of you will learn this and you will do this. Listen, you know, a bunch of failures in those, in those types of structures were guys like Einstein and Newton. They didn't function well uh, in those environments because they were, they were free thinkers and so there is a beauty to that. And when you show your children uh, at the museum, for example, uh, you guys, you ought to go. You ought to go to the Huntington Library, for example. And there's art there, not only art, but gardens. Show your kids. They have oil paintings from Monet and others that are in the, in the, uh, in the, the, the house. What's it called? It's a mansion. You know, whatever that, that is. Was. Look at their home, look at their art, but then go out and into, their, the, into their gardens and you can say, look at the... See, you saw the painting that Monet did, right? You saw he used oil. Yeah, yeah. Look at this. Look at this, what God did and all of those incredible plants that they have there. Your kid will get more education in a half a day at the Huntington Library than they will anywhere else for a long time. It's quite remarkable. But you study your kid and you train them up so that when it comes to art, your kid should have the, the, the wherewithal to say, what's happening here? 
You have to remember something. You say, what does that have to do with the church service? That has a lot to do with it. If you look, as Will mentioned, if you look at historical art, it tells a story. You can go to the National Portrait Gallery and see paintings of the coming millennia when Christ reigns. And they make you want to step into the painting. Versus insanity. Can I say something Please. just there about what you're talking about with Newton and, and, and Einstein and those kind of things? When it comes to the public school, I just have to say this. I think we should abolish the public schools. I think they are awful institutions. Department of Education. Yeah, all of it. Gone. No. Gone. Because even a relevance of, uh, of politics, obviously they're indoctrinating kids and teaching them trans ideology and climate change, BLM stuff. The modern public school system does not teach a child, first of all, anything about God. Thomas Jefferson said there should be a Bible in every school in America. Right. And now, see how far that's gone. Sorry, listen, and, sorry, keep your thought, because you're young, you'll, you'll remember to... <laughs> did, you, did you guys know that Benjamin Rush, the first Surgeon General of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson, they were good buddies? Do you know what they founded? They founded the public school system. You say, well, that's a bad idea. Not when they founded it. Do you know why? Read them in their own words. They were concerned that there were families growing up without a biblical knowledge. What he just said is so true. It was Jefferson who said, these kids need to come to a class where a Bible will be the book of curriculum. Did you know that? The first book of the United States in the colonies, the first book was the Bible. Did you know that you could not graduate from Harvard, Princeton, or Yale without being able to know Hebrew and Greek and Latin? And you had Bible at Harvard University every single day. Did you know that? Samuel Adams ditched a few classes. He got thrown out for it. And uh, he, walked, he talked himself back into Harvard. But you guys, that's, that's America's footing that we've come so far from. Sorry, you're so young, you can pick it up where you left off. Pretend like that didn't even happen, okay? <laughs> but the thing even irrelevant of the godlessness of the schools and the politics of the schools is that it doesn't teach young people how to be creative, articulate, or how to think for themselves. It teaches you at school who's the best at memorizing. Who's the best memorizer? You go and take a test and it's who, who memorized the facts the best. It doesn't teach you how to, to be creative or how to think of something new and brilliant. That's why these men who are these great thinkers who thought of new things didn't suit very well for these types of systems because it doesn't teach people how to be creative. It teaches you how to be obedient to authority. So, yeah, I think the public school system is a sham in this country. And what, don't take him the wrong way. He's not saying we should abolish teachers. Think about it. If the public school system was gone then it would only leave those who love to teach. Teaching. Do you hear me? Yeah. Shouldn't that be the way it, it operates anyhow? Shouldn't that be the teacher that's teaching your kid? It's someone who really loves to teach. My goodness. I mean, it seems so basic, you know? Um, individual versus collective or the collectivism, right? Uh, the Beauty of Unpopular Opinions. What's that all about? That's chapter 10. Yeah, that one's one of my favorite chapters. The Beauty of Unpopular Opinions. I can tell you guys a, a short story real quick about Abraham Lincoln that you guys might not know that I include here in the book that I think is so important. Abraham Lincoln wasn't a huge believer when he first took office. He wasn't much of a Christian in, in that sense. He, he was religious, but not that much. And so at the beginning of the war, the Union had more resources, more men, more money, more everything, yet they were losing the war. They were losing the war to the South, and they couldn't figure out why. And then eventually, Abraham Lincoln, his son, Willie, dies of tuberculosis. It's incredibly sad. So now Lincoln is trying to, to be a husband to his wife, trying to be the president, and trying to win this war and, and grieve over his son all at the same time. He's distraught. He's aging. You can see the pictures of him. He's aging. And he eventually sees this nurse at the White House who is, who is consoling his wife during this hard time. And she's excited. She's jovial. She's having a good time. Even though her, her husband died in the war, two of her three sons died in the, in the, in the war fighting for the North. And he goes up to her and says, basically, how can you be so happy during this time? It's an evil time. It's horrible. And she says, well, Mr. President, I, I met God. And Abraham Lincoln essentially says, well, can you introduce me? 
And so the, the two of them start talking, and, and eventually she does Bible work with Lincoln. And they, you should read his devotional, if you guys haven't read his devotional, to get a lot of information there. But the two become very close friends. And in Lincoln's, he becomes a strong, strong believer. His faith drives everything he does after that. And in his second inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln comes on and says the Civil War... He says, paraphrasing, but he says, a civil war was a punishment from God for the institution of slavery. That's, right. That's what Abraham Lincoln That's comes right. on and says. But, and so he says, I'm going to get rid of slavery. His entire cabinet says, don't get rid of it. The people in the north, a lot of people in the north at that time still, they wanted slavery, and many of them still racist. They said, don't get rid of it. His own wife came and said, do not get rid of it. It is political suicide to get rid of this. And what did he do? He got rid of it. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation, got rid of slavery in America, and now is one of the most heralded men of all time. And so when we talk about unpopular opinions, I mean, even the Founding Fathers, the Founding Fathers, this handful of men who went in and started this radical, crazy ideology to start a new country. I mean, it's incredible stuff that when you have a, a small group of people or even one individual who has an unpopular opinion that they know to be true from objective truth, you have no idea how much good you can do. And I think that's really powerful with, with how we are in America, especially with how, how worried we are about what everyone thinks about us in the social media and age and everything. I tell this story. In the 1970s, they tried to study zebras. And they couldn't really study zebras all too well because they all have stripes on them, right? They're, they're hard to tell apart. And so they put a big red circle on one of these zebras so they could watch and study the zebra. Well, the next day, that zebra got eaten by a lion. So... <laughs> You know, that's what happens. It's dangerous to be a zebra with a big red circle on it. That's, they found that out in their research. But the reason I tell this story is that it's very easy to think about it and say, I want to conform. I want to be the zebra who looks just like all the other zebras and, and not have anything ever happen to me and be just like everyone else. But we have to be able to venture out into the world and be the dangerous person to do yes. risky and brave things that, that fights against the evil that we see in this country right now. We have to be willing to, to do something risky with our lives to achieve greatness. This is a good plug right now for, um, yep. I don't know if you guys know this. I mean, some of you do. But uh, I, will, I love what Will just said about these kids being dangerous and courageous and adventurous. Uh, we have... Um, Heritage Girls here at this church and Trail Life uh, for, the, for the boys. And it teaches them exactly that, how to be what God created you to be and to learn what you should be learning. And it's, it's fascinating because the kids love it. They absolutely love it. And uh, look, you throw, you throw a pile of dirt on the, on the ground and boys will jump headfirst into it and start eating it. But the girls might, if they touch it at all, they'll, they'll make something constructive and meaningful out of it. And then the guys will come by and blow it up. Don't tell me there's not a difference. Uh, no common ground with people who hate us. That's an interesting chapter. Yeah. I agree with that, but tell me what you think. Communism as an ideology killed 100 million people. It is the most evil, insidious, terrible ideology in human history killed more people than any other ideology ever. And it's not, it's not even thinking about the 100 million dead, but, but the businesses that were burned, the economies destroyed, the families separated, the women that were raped because of communism, and what happened? Now, you look at America, and we have people in this country who are communists. You have yep. people in our, in our places of power that are communists. Maybe they say democratic socialists. Maybe they say build back better, a green new deal. They're communists in the ideologies that they present, yeah, right? It's true. Marxist ideologies. Rhinos. Right, right. I mean, these types of Not people. with circles on them. No, <laughs> no, no. Rhinos. No. no, different type of rhino, yeah. And definitely less brave than a rhino with a circle on it. <laughs> yes. But these, these types of people are in this country, and what do conservatives and Christians constantly do? We say, we will find common ground with you. Why do we find common ground with an ideology that killed 100 million people? We don't find common ground with that. You don't find common ground with someone who says abortion, I'm using quotation, abortion is fine after the baby is born, after nine months. You don't find common ground with someone who says, I'm going to cut the penis off of a little boy and tell them they're a girl. What you do is you get that doctor's office shut down and that doctor's Absolute license arrested. revoked. Absolutely arrested. Because these ideas have to be eradicated from America. These types of evil ideas cannot be allowed to spread. I've been, I mean, I've been on a three-week-long book tour right now. 
going all across the country, from Florida all the way here to California. This is actually my last stop on the tour, and I'm heading back home tomorrow mm -hmm. to Tampa. And I've been all over to these college campuses, and you see everything that I'm talking about with the fear and the, the, the compromising with all of the students at these places. And this is the number one message that I try to get into their heads and say, do not care what these people think about you. It doesn't matter if someone who says that you can uh, abort after birth likes you. You know, this is why I was quite disappointed with what Donald Trump said the other day yeah. when he said that he didn't know if he would sign a 15-week ban. And yep. that was sick. I, I totally get it. But in terms of what we believe as people who are unequivocally pro-life, life begins at conception, to see that from Donald Trump is quite disappointing to me. Yep. And he said... He yep. said what was so sad is that he said, I'm going to find a plan where the Democrats and the Republicans like me. Screw the Democrats. I don't care if they like me. You know? He, like, I don't care if he, these people like yep. me. And he's lost uh, tremendous support since that happened, tragically. Um, my goodness. Um, you talk about these unpopular opinions and the, the trap. The Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. Think about a snare. We don't really, we don't snare things. <laughs> we go to the store. <laughs> but it's not a pretty thing. When a deer or a bear, whatever it might be, a fox, gets caught in a snare. It's a long, long death. For maybe days, they bleed out slowly. The fear of man, the Bible says, Solomon warns us, the fear of man is a snare. The New Testament echoes the exact same words. The fear of man is a snare. So when you fear what other people think about you, from what you wear to what you think. Tragically, you, for whatever reasons, have either allowed yourself to be compromised or you're choosing a compromising path. You certainly may not be aware, and this could be good news to some of you here tonight, you're certainly perhaps not aware of the incredible awesomeness of God making you an individual. We study, we look at things in nature and say, look how fantastic that snowflake is. It's so beautiful. There's no, snow, there's no snowflake like this one. And that's true. If God shows you examples like that in nature, what about you? But see, the system out there, this world that we're living in right now, tries to get you to think the same thoughts and do the same things. Keep your mouth shut and do not be critical. I mean that in a good way, not bad critical. We need to get back, by the way, to critical thinking. That's how you invent things. Critical thinking, not I'm critical of you. No, I'm talking about asking teachers why. Oh, the world's 100 trillion years old. Ask the, the kid should say, how do you know? No, I'm dead serious. That's critical thinking. That's making. Let's, let's talk about that claim. Some of you are teaching your kids what's called classical conversation. The edu... The edu the, that one right there. Um... <laughs> But that's how, you know, we love the genius. You mentioned these 56 guys in the room. Uh, uh, Congressman Bob McEwen said in the study of history, in American history, he has never found in world history where there was ever 56 human beings in the same room of that level of intellect. Dependent upon God, no matter what denomination they were from. The Congregationalists agreed to disagree with the Methodists, which agreed to disagree with the Unitarian, which agreed to disagree with the Anabaptist. Are you hearing me? They laid that stuff to the side and they crafted the greatest constitutional form of government, a republic that the world has ever seen. And these guys were geniuses, 56 of them. There was, there was, there was no woke nut in the corner somewhere getting in on the photo shoot. They were all brilliant. Read about their lives. Their lives were so public. But they didn't care what King George said. They didn't care what anybody said. They didn't care what France said. They didn't care, they didn't care what the pirates and the, the, uh, the corsairs and the Barbary pirates were doing. They didn't care. They said, this is what God says. This is what we're going to do. We have, John Adams said, we have no king but Jesus. Yeah. Think about that. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> so young people today, you, gotta, you cannot hand people control over your life. And let's be honest. Think, think for a moment. You're not even sure if that person's real. Oh, he made a comment on my Facebook page. 
Who did? This guy. And it's like, I mean, I'm sorry. I just have no tolerance for a kid that's weeping over the comment of some... Joe Johnson made this comment about you? Tell me, who's Joe Johnson? I don't know. Exactly. Is he real? You have no idea. It could be a bot. It could be fake. It could be your friend on a false name playing to their head. Who cares? If you know what God thinks about you, you're going to be fine. Also, it's interesting to note that those, if we're talking to young people, those founding fathers, I mean, some of them were very, very young men very at young. the time. Yeah, 22 years old and, and young. I mean, yeah. Jefferson, I think Jefferson was the youngest at like 34, something like that. He was su- super young. Yeah, Franklin was obviously the old guy, but that's fascinating. It made me think, and my mind just went... Very young, very young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Becoming a hero in a dangerous world, kind of what we're talking about. Go for it. Becoming a hero in a dangerous world, this was actually my favorite chapter to write because I see so many young people. Have you guys heard this trend about why young men are thinking of ancient Rome? You guys have heard about this? Well, the reason why I... No, I have not heard this. Tell me. You haven't heard this? What is this? Wait, say it again. Why young men are thinking of ancient Rome. Oh, tell me. It's, it's this trend of, of girlfriends filming their boyfriends and saying, how often do you think about ancient Rome? And then the, the boys or the men answer and say how often. They, and they'll be like, once a week or, you know, every, every couple weeks, whatever it is. It shows that, for the most part, men are thinking of ancient Rome. But what I write about in the book is that more than just ancient Rome that men are thinking about, they're thinking about World War II, they're thinking about knights and medieval times, they're thinking about conquistadors, whatever it might be. They're thinking about all these different times in history where there were heroic men and heroic people that did heroic things that went against the odds and vanquished evil. And you have young men in America thinking about that so much today, whether it's ancient Rome or D-Day storming the beaches, whatever it might be, because they have no sense of real purpose or adventure or quest or heroism in their life. Mm. I mean, think about the life of a young person. You go, you, like we talked about in the public schools, you just go and, and essentially learn how to memorize. And especially if you're a boy, you're told that girl behaviors are good and boy behaviors are bad. You should be more like a girl. Then you go to college and it's just every vice is, is satiated and you're indoctrinated even more. You get out of college, move to some urban city. You answer emails all day. You go to the same bars as everyone else. Mm. And that's your life. And you never get into any real relationships because you're just swiping online and so worried about social media validation. This is the life of a young person today, surrounded by ugliness, by weakness, by no sense of heroism, by politicians who they they despise and and have such apathy towards because they don't feel like they actually do anything for their lives. I mean, young men today just have no sense. And then they join, like, joining the military, and you see all this woke stuff in it. You can't even find any sense of heroism nowadays in in the military things. And it's all so much technology nowadays, too. And so young men lack that sense of purpose Mm. and meaning, so they're thinking of something else. Becoming a hero in a dangerous world is about finding that passion and creativity and spark inside of you to do something that is magical and incredible and and going out of your way to help other people. I read this story the other day about this farmer who would always win this corn-growing contest. This was uh, about 100 years ago. He would win this corn-growing contest, and he would give his award-winning seeds to the other farmers next to him. And the, the person who did the contest came up to him and said, why would you give your seeds, these winning seeds, to the other people around you? Aren't they going to then win if you give them your seeds? And he says, well, actually, mine can't win unless the other people have the good corn too because we all pollinate each other and it makes it better. Mm-hmm. So the only way for me to have the winning and the best corn is for everyone to have the best corn. And I use this as a story as an example to say that becoming a hero is, is not about doing something for yourself. It's about doing something for goodness for, for others and, and going exactly out of your way to live that dangerous life. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'll say one more thing about that that I think is so important. Public school and universities and, and a lot of parents actually, sorry to say it, coddle their kids and coddle the, the, the youth in this country and tell them that you should never suffer. Suffering is bad. And that if anything ever troubles you or hurts you, that is wrong and you should be suffering averse to the highest degree. This is a fault. You need to be taking suffering and not just saying, okay, here we go, but embracing suffering. 
having suffering come into your life and using it as fuel to light your fire going forward to be the great, incredible person that you can be. You have to take these experiences, learn from them, and learn how you can help other people through the suffering that you have. Don't, don't complain. Don't be ungrateful. Don't, don't feel like the entire world's against you. And maybe the entire world is against you if you stand up for what you believe in. But that should be okay. It should be okay to have all these forces against you. It doesn't mean that that, that, that makes you a sad or miserable person. It means, wow, now I have something to really fight for. I love that. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have difficulties. In this world, Jesus said, you're going to have difficulties. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That means, listen, it simply means this, that your, your uh, hardships and the injuries and the issues that have come against you, uh, they don't define you. Well, they shouldn't define you. Because Paul the Apostle went on to tell us also that he found strength in all of the weaknesses that he had encountered in life. That when he was weak, he said, that's when I have found myself to be strong because God was his strength. I love Joshua chapter one. Five times in that one chapter, God challenges and exhorts Joshua to be strong and of good courage and be not afraid. For the Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. Man, you have somebody with a worldview like that, you can't stop them. You guys, we're gonna save the best for last. I'm gonna spring this on Will. Um, let's, let's, let's close, the, let's, let's do this because we have 20 minutes left. So you got out of college by the skin of your teeth, um, but you're a published author. You're a documentary uh, producer. You've got your own digital uh, news platform. You're, how old are you? Just turned 27. That's disgusting. Um, I feel disgusting sometimes. That's amazing. Yeah, don't worry. Okay, 27 years old. Um, you must have had an incredible upbringing for you to accomplish all that you have in such a short period of time. You must have had such a cush, gold spoon in your mouth kind of upbringing, right? I, I wish that was the case, Jack. It's uh, not really the case you for me. me no, I don't mind you asking me this whatsoever. And, and it's something that I, I talk about in this book for anyone who has read the book. Uh, you will understand my story, but I'll, I'll tell it here a little more in depth for you guys, but I probably won't say it as well as I wrote it because it's something that's very emotional for me and it's something that is, is difficult for me to talk about. But growing up my entire life, I was a, an atheist and my, uh, I didn't believe in God because of things that had happened to me and I said because of this, it means that God can't be real. And I still saw, you know, Christians died in traffic accidents and Jews died in childbirth. The Muslims died walking across the street. It was, uh, it was like, where was God if all these horrible things were happening to, to me and to other people? And when I was a young man, I was uh, sexually assaulted over and over again by a male member of my family. Happened for years. And it was something that was incredibly traumatic for me. I didn't actually even remember it again until I was in middle school and had gotten in trouble at school, and it all came flooding back to me. And uh, it's something that I've also never said in public before, going out and, and talking about this. I've been in the, the spotlight, I guess you could say, in political world for the last six or seven years, and I've, I've never, never once come out and talk, talked about it or anything because I, I didn't really know exactly what to say. And I, I talk about my faith journey and everything, and I, you know, when I, I became a Christian because I read the Bible, and it was during COVID, and I read the four Gospels, and I read them, and I had to make a choice. I could either ignore them, I could believe that they were lies, or I could believe that it was the truth. And I was so moved by the words that were within those pages that I had no other choice but to give my life to Christ. And so I did, and Pastor Jack Gibbs baptized me. Thank you. And it wasn't until just about, you know, when that happened, and then even actually a little further on, uh, that I realized that everything that happened to me and happened in my life and all the sadness and guilt and shame that I carried with me since I was a boy, remembering this, and then being a man now. I mean, this is, I'm talking about even a year ago when I was still moving to Florida. I mean, I got diagnosed with PTSD because of this and, and everything because of what happened. You realize that 
you can give it all to Christ and you don't have to carry the guilt and shame around and you can give it to Him to take care of it for you. And I, I look back on everything that's happened and I wouldn't change my life for anything in the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and change anything because I know that when I'm, when I'm talking about embracing suffering and this, you know, I'm not just speaking out of my butt as some guy who grew up with a silver spoon and saying, you know, just get with it and pick yourself up by your bootstraps. I mean, I, I feel as myself a, a testament to the ideology that I preach to people because I can tell you how, how important it is to, to be someone to have, to have struggles and say, I'm not going to let this overpower me because for my entire life I let it overpower me. Yes. And then said no and worked with God and God saved me and brought me back from all of this. So, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And, you know, it's, it's so funny when you, like, I've been in this political world for the last seven years, that, like I said, and then you get into it where I used to just care about how many views I got on the videos, how many books did I sell, how, how, how many people are following me, how many likes I got, comments. Like, these are the things that really mattered to me when I was first starting at PragerU and working in the political world. I might not have admitted it out to anyone, but those were the things that mattered. And then I found, I found God and everything changes. You find that the faith drives all the politics. That's why we've been up here on this stage. And some of you guys who've been watching me for years, or maybe you've just met me, whatever it is, you're thinking, I thought tonight was going to be talking about Trump 2024 20, and DeSantis and you know, politics moving forward. That's not what I find to be the most important thing. I, I, I want to make good people. That's what, that's what matters to me. If we had all the people in this room today vow to be good people and, and live by the tenets we're supposed to live by. And trust me, I'm not one of these people who lives by these things. Of course not. I'm a sinner fully, full and through. But if we all, if all the Republicans and Christians and conservatives in California all came together, we could fix California in a day if we all vowed to do that instead of worrying about the politics. And now I have just some of the, the most the most amazing people in my life. i got Pastor Jack here. i just the best guy in the whole world. Really. Thank you, man. Thank you. Man. Oh. And I, I dedicated my book to, uh, I dedicated my book to my pastor in, in Tampa, a guy named Jake English. Hope he's watching right now. He's, he taught me so much and has been just, he's been like my dad. Not having a dad, he has come in and stepped in. As, and I know you said you were like my dad. So I have two dads. It's just pretty, yeah. Yeah, pretty normal in California, I guess these days. But, you know. So, well, that's okay. <laughs> but, but dedicated to him and my entire family has been just my mom and my sister and all these people are just amazing, beautiful people. And my fantastic girlfriend, Lindsay, who I spend all my time with. And she's been with me my entire tour. And so please, just for Lindsay, thank you. Thank you. Ah. And all of you guys, I mean, I don't really know what else to say. I love you guys, too. You know, I thank you. I, I'll say one more thing just about that, with him saying, I love you, Will. I find so much in the conservative media world today, I'm very disappointed in it. I feel a lot of ways like I don't really want to be a part of it so much anymore. Um, I see what happens on social media with the videos that people make and the takes that they have, and I'm like... You're just finding a leftist video and then saying, this is wrong, and then just looking for the next video to bring yourself some sort of validation or fame behind saying that. And so when we're talking about the people who we have in our, our sphere that we're looking at, I think it's very important now, more than ever, that from our politicians, the influencers, pastors even, all of these types of people, we need to demand more from them. We need to demand more from them or they're going to keep getting away with giving us the bottom of the barrel and, and, and the least common denominator. We have to demand more from the people who we have put into positions of power. I so Thank appreciate you. your comments on that because um, I was just asked that actually today. Um, how is it that in California um, you guys just keep fighting for what's right? You, you know you're, gonna, you're outnumbered. You know you're going to lose. What keeps you guys going back to the fight. And I told the guy in the interview, I said, has, 
it has nothing to do with is this a winnable war or not uh, regarding gender neutral showers or the gen, you know the, the marriage issue or abortion it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if it's winnable I never approach something and test the wind to see if it's a winnable campaign. I don't mean campaign in politics. I mean a campaign in warfare. I don't test the air to determine if we're going to win this particular battle on the, pl- on the war, on the field. What drives the, sh- the, the continuous showing up to the battle, even in the face of losing, is that I know the Bible... And you and I may lose in the court of public opinion, or we may have our victory. You could lose, your, you could lose heart and never again show up to a school board meeting or the ballot box. But you're not doing it to win it in this world. In the short term, you may lose it, but you know how this ends. So there's a day after being told no for decades by the world, there's going to be a day when God will say, you know what, you lost, like Lincoln, you mentioned Lincoln, you lost and lost and lost and lost and you ran again. By the way, Lincoln's last words to Mary was, he said, Mary, I want to walk with Jesus in Jerusalem. Did you know that was his last words? How does a guy like that recover exactly as Will was talking about? Just constant setbacks, the horrific difficulties he had in life. How did he get out of bed? Well, God knew in the moment when was the right time for Lincoln to hear the truth where that young woman would come by and tell him why she had peace. You look around the world tonight, friends. People, think about the world without God. They've gone from the fear and the tyranny of COVID now to the fear and tyranny of a looming global war. People are scared to death and they don't need to be. You have in you, as a believer, the Holy Spirit, who has sealed you until the day of redemption. That means your your moment now, your tomorrow, your future, God knows all about it. You don't have to worry about it. And you need to live free. You say, Jack, that's impossible. No, no, no. Stop thinking like that because he has sent us his truth. And he is the truth. And he said, this will set you free. And it sets you free. His word sets you completely free. So I told the guy, I said, listen, it's, it's the fact that I'm fighting for what's right. Because what's right never changes. It may lose in the short term here and there along the way. But eternally, there's going to be a day of judgment. And God is going to say, you know, think about it. All of our heads are going to be hanging down. I should have done more. I should have did this whatsoever. I think God is going to pick our chin up off of our chest and say, listen, do you remember when you said this? Do you remember when you stood there? Remember when you showed up? That's what I would have done. But I felt like I failed you. You did what I asked you to do. You were faithful at what I gave you. Yeah, but I didn't lead a stadium of people to, to Christ. Well, he'll, he's going to say to you, I didn't call you to lead a stadium of people to Christ. I asked you to be a faithful school teacher or a good judge or an excellent police officer or a wonderful mom or a wonderful dad. That's what I called you to do. We're going to be judged as believers not on our eternal destination. That's been secured in Christ. We're going to be judged on our faithfulness to what he called us to do. 